All right, here we are back at Silver Lake Country Club for the NFL alumni outing, Northeast Ohio, Cleveland chapter, TJ Downing. Jim Ballard floating, floating the ground somewhere here. We're joined with <laughs> Willie Spencer. Talk to us uh, a little bit about your dealings with the NFL alumni throughout the years. We know we saw you last time over there at the Constellation Center for Excellence with the NFL alumni health, um, hearing from David Pierce and, and how he's able to impact some of you guys. And, and just talk about your experience here working with the NFL alumni. Yeah, abs absolutely. Anytime I can come out and support, I'm always down for it. Uh, Frank Stams and I uh, live close here up in the falls. So I've known Frank for a few years now. And like I said, it's just a great experience to come out and see guys that, you know, you may have watched on TV or guys that you may even play with. Um, to come out and see those guys after, you know, years of being apart and um, fellowship and talk about old times. And, and uh, it's just a great time. And it's, and it's for a great cause. So, you know, I'm always down for it. So your playing days go all the way back to the Maslin Tigers, man, and all that glory. Talk about how that kind of prepared you. Uh, entering into to college and ultimately playing in the NFL? Well, oh, absolutely. I mean, Maslin is a big-time high school program, and, you know, on average we have thousands of fans, so um, it prepares you to, uh, you know, to, to perform at a high level, um, to perform in front of people, and, um, and uh, you know, when you come, come from a high school like Maslin that has, uh, uh, you know, a great history, um, and so many players have come through Maslin, and made it to the pros. You know, they really set, set the standard high. Um, so being a competitor like, like myself, you want to, you know, you want to rise to the occasion. I know your uh, father just passed away. Talk about what he meant to you uh, growing up, football, all of that. Oh, man, it, you know, Pops meant so much to me, man, and um, it still doesn't seem real. It still seems foggy. Um, but again, you know, Pops going from, from high school to the pros, um, he set the bar high, and uh, he gave me an inner confidence um, uh, inner determination but that's hard to explain um, but when your father you know reached uh, you know the, the pinnacle of the profession you're trying to you're trying to get to or you're trying to accomplish um, seeing that firsthand um, it really it really just uh, it, it sets the tone uh, within yourself and gives you the confidence to uh, to get to that level I miss pops uh, he meant a lot to me um, I think about him all the time I will always think about him and um, I thank him for being who he was and having the courage to do what he did to be an 18, 19 year old kid and, and to go directly to the pros, you know, it took a lot of courage. Yep. Yep. I'll tell you what, we're cut from the same cloth in a lot of those aspects. You know, I was fortunate enough to have a dad who was a captain all American at Michigan, won a Super Bowl with the 49ers, you know, and as a young lineman just growing up trying to figure out the game and just trying to have that confidence in myself, you know, to have a father like that that we've been able to lean on. Um, it, it's it, it's such a blessing. Um, when you look back at your, your fondest memories as a player on the field, talk about some of those for us. My fondest memories would probably be, you know, I think about guys I played against. You know, I think about 1998, um, uh, Randy Moss, uh, when I was at Akron, we played Marshall at Marshall, you know, seeing Randy. I mean, unbelievable player. I think about, uh, I think about um, Charles Woodson in high school, you know, Fremont Ross, 1994 um, in Parma. A playoff game you know he's probably one of the best players him well, along with Randy are two of the best players I've, I've ever seen in person I think about Champ Bailey in practice in 01 with the Redskins seeing some things that he did on the field you know that's what I think about the guys that I played with or against um, and seeing you know their athletic ability and seeing what type of players they were um, it was a treat Hall of Famers right there, man. That's a trio of Hall of Famers, man. It, it forces you to raise your game, man. Absolutely. Willie Spencer, I appreciate you joining hey, us on the 1372 you Show. Hey, hit them long, hit them straight, man. You got a beautiful day. Absolutely. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Yep. Here we are again on another 1372 show, the QB and the OG. I'm TJ Downing, joined by two QBs today that can spin it. And to win it with my man Jim Ballard, the College Football Hall of Famer and 15-year NFL vet and Super Bowl champ, Brad Johnson. Brad, appreciate you coming on the show with us. Obviously, you and Jim, uh, you got history going back to the London Monarch days. So I'm going to let my man roll with it here because uh, I know the QBs. I know how you guys are when you start talking, man. <laughs> you just push the O-line guys and all the other skill guys to the side, man. You guys run the show. Move no, to the side. To Jim can sling that thing. We're, we're roommates together in Atlanta, Swanee. Oh, with that's right. Yeah. From London Monarch. So he could sling it. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you bring that up, Brad, because today is actually the day that the uh, NFL Alumni Academy kicks off their second year. Uh, guys are moving in. Dean Dalton, who's running the Alumni Academy, is uh, 
bringing more guys into Canton last year. They had, I, I believe they brought in around 50 guys, 17 of them ended up sign, uh, signing contracts in the NFL. But for us, I, I know what it did personally for my career, being able to win a World Bowl in 1996. But the guys in 95, I mean, talk about some of the guys that were there and what it meant for you and your career to, to have a league like, like NFL Europe or the World League, as I should say, back in 95. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Dean Dalton, we were together actually in Minnesota. He was our running back coach when I was up there my, uh, my second time. So make sure you tell him I said hello and everything. But, you know, for me, Jim, I, I mean, you played a lot more than I did in college. Honestly, like in college, I, I think I started six or seven games. Maybe I was backing up. In our quarterback room, we had um, uh, Danny McManus and Chip Ferguson, Peter Tom Willis, who played in the NFL, and Casey Weldon was my guy I was fighting out with. He was running up to the Heisman and um, Chris Winkie, Heisman National Championship, and Charlie Ward, Heisman National Championship. And it, was, it was extremely competitive, but I didn't play much. And my first few years in the NFL, I didn't get to play much either. There, I was backing up um, Rich Gannon, Sean Salisbury, Jim McMahon, Warren Moon. And so I, I, I asked the uh, Brian Billick, our offense coordinator, this new league was coming back out and to go to be allocated and got to play for London Monarchs with you. And really, it was just an opportunity to go play. And I needed that playing time experience. I probably wasn't that good at that time and, and, and those kind of things. But learn to go make um, – thankful for opportunity to, you know, lead a team and make mistakes, make plays, um, deal with, you know, putting in Proud protections, <laughs> deal Just, with all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? The chaos. But it was, it was one of those things, Jim, for both of us. We grinded, got through it. And a few of those guys went on um, – Obviously, Kurt Warner went on to win a Super Bowl, and uh, Jay Feeler and John Kidna and many other guys kind of made it because of that world league gave us an opportunity to play. You know, I was in training camp, Brad, back in 2007 with Kurt Warner and the Arizona Cardinals. Um, you know, he was he was dedicated the entire time throughout high school and the college at the quarterback spot. You you come in as a hooper. Talk about your learning curve and how I mean, really, four years to us in college goes by goes by like that. You know, to then being able to have 15 years of professional football, you know, kind of riding that wave through college. I mean, I think one of the seasons you started out four and two, and then they opted to go to another quarterback. Right, right. Um, well, my college experience wasn't that great, to be honest with you. <laughs> I only played uh, six or seven games, honestly. And it was just, it's competitive. But honestly, you know, growing up for me, I was a basketball fanatic. I love playing basketball. And that's the more fun sport for anybody to go play in the backyard or playing pickup games, the YMCA or whatever, just because you can go play at all times. You can't really do that in football. But I was a basketball junkie. I wanted to go play. I actually wanted to go play for a guy named Bobby Krim. He's at Georgia Tech. And when he brought me into his office, and he said, Brad, you can come here, but uh, there's another guy I've signed. It's a guy named Dennis Scott. And Dennis, he actually played left years in the shoot. NBA. Boy, he could shoot it now. He could shoot it. He could. And uh, Dennis Scott changed my life, and, and he doesn't even know or probably doesn't even know my name, but but I knew not to go there at the time. And, knew, and, and Bobby Kramers, he's fair to me. He said, Brad, what do you got more, more potential in? So I told him I had more potential and thought I had a chance to play maybe pro in football than I did a six-foot-five guy that could only shoot and couldn't do anything else in basketball. But I was a late bloomer in football. I started uh, played two years of basketball at Florida State. And then I had to make a, a total decision, either one sport or the other, and then kind of made that commitment to football and kind of got better probably later in my career than – Obviously, in my college day, my first few years in the NFL. So what led to that decision where, where you're sitting there? You, you might be in your room down there in, in Tallahassee, like, okay, I'm going to put this basketball thing to the side, even though it's my love and it's my passion. Or your first was, one, at least. Yeah, well, I played two years. But, you know, first year at Florida State, I was redshirted. It's so like, what am I doing? I'm not, in, you know, <laughs> sharing scout team reps with Casey Weldon, you know. And and we weren't really – at that time, you didn't really expect to play to maybe your junior or senior year. You you would ask me red shirt in football and kind of work your way up. And now it's different. If you're not playing after your first or second year, you're probably transferring. So, but for me, playing those first years of basketball, the first year, you know, I got in basketball shape because I could leave football early the next year, but then I was missing half of spring football because of the NCAA tournament. And then the next year I couldn't go to basketball because the football season went so long and I was kind of out of basketball shape. And then I, I missed half of spring football. So I'm like, I was competing against someone in both sports and I was missing time in both sports. I wasn't really kind of being, I wasn't the starter and then I wasn't getting a full You're not gaining any ground. Not gaining any ground. And I said, why did I come here? Why did I come to Florida State? 
is to be the starter and hopefully have a chance to make it to the NFL. So I had to make a, a decisive decision and, and it worked out. It's not, and it wasn't like you were playing bad in basketball. I mean, you went to the March Madness and I mean, I, I just saw a clip that at one point you were 40 for 45 from the free throw line. That's, that's, that's pretty good spinning, man. Yeah. Yeah. I could shoot, I could shoot the free throws. <laughs> couldn't get the shot off against those guys. I couldn't take it to the hole. But uh, I mean, you realize how long guys are in basketball. I mean, Six seven, six eight, six nine, six ten is, is different than six five and short arms and can't jump. So, <laughs> but you know, there, there's you kind of have. I, I was a role player in basketball. I could shoot it and you could pass it, but there was a limit to where I was going to go. And you know, at that time, the guy they were preaching to me was a guy. Uh, kind of one of the reasons why I started wearing number fourteen was Benny Testaverde. He was the guy at that time. Uh, he was the Heisman winner at Miami. They won a national. Uh, they were playing for the national championship. And, those kind of things. He was six foot five, two twenty five, and that was the prototypical guy coming out. And uh, you know, and he ended up having, I think, a twenty year career or something like that. So that was the guy I kind of looked up to at that time. Brad Johnson joining us on the thirteen seventy two show. The QB and the OG were here at the Hall of Fame Village, powered by Johnson Controls. They got some dirt moving back there, getting ready to start working on that indoor facility. As we know, that NFL Alumni Academy reported today, they're doing some testing this week. Going to get some practices started with Anthony Munoz and Mike Tice next week. Uh, Brad, to the NFL stuff now, man. I mean, a 15-year NFL career, uh, four different teams, two stops in Minnesota. What was – I've talked to Jim before, you know, because you guys kind of had that same path uh, uh, getting picked up by NFL teams. Your your first ah moment that I'm in the league right now, he always tells me, you know, hanging out with Bernie Kosar and, and Dan Marino. You come in there and, and, and you're backing up a guy like Warren Moon. I mean, for you, I mean, that's got to be a guy that back when you were in high school, you're watching him do his thing like – it's like, wow, you know, this is a Hall of Famer yeah. right here from here. Is it, or is it on the other hand, throwing a, your first touchdown pass to a guy like CeCe? All the above. All the above. <laughs> and, and, you know, I remember in, you know, the 19, I think it was the, was the 85 Bears. Was that, was that, that World Champs? Yep. Yeah. And I was looking up to Jim McMahon. Yeah. And the next thing I know, Jim McMahon is my roommate in training camp. You know, <laughs> we're all wearing the headband, Adidas, and all that kind of stuff in high school. And, you know, Roger Craig was on the team and Anthony Carter. And, Jack Del Rio, and I mean, it was a list of Hall of Famers that we had on our team, uh, Randall McDaniel, and, and the list goes on. But, but I think you know, at some point you got to get over that. You know, you got to be, you can't be afraid to <laughs> kind of chime back at the Chris Carter, or chime back at you know some of the great players because you're working together. You know, it's not, it can't be a hierarchy, especially at the quarterback position. But at some point you get over that, and you just, you know, you're regular teammates, and you're earning the job, and you're leading the team. So. But um, I don't know if there's just one moment like that, but I think the more, the more I was with the guys, we just, you know, and felt more comfortable in my own skin and confident in my game that kind of just kind of took off from there. I guess one thing you could say as far as like, you know, chopping down and starting to do your own thing after, you know, a career of 166 touchdowns, 29,000 plus yards. I mean, you, uh, you at one time were backing up Rich Gannon. And I always felt like, Going back to all the Super Bowls I've seen through history, starting when my dad was able to win one with Joe Montana in Super Bowl 16 and all the way through. And most of those Super Bowls always kind of featured a, a Hall of Fame quarterback or two of those guys going back and forth. To me, I thought one of the greatest Super Bowls uh, that, you know, and I don't know where where Rich would stand one day getting in, obviously, but uh, to you and Rich going back and forth in that Super Bowl, you know, you two guys being the QBs coming in there, that's your moment to say, hey, listen, you know, I may have backed this guy up once, but now it's my show, and and obviously you guys handled business. Yeah, I have so much respect for Rich Gannon. I came in there, and I watched him work the first year. I mean, just endless worker, tough and gritty and all the above. We had similar careers in a sense. Uh, he was at Minnesota for a while, then he, he was out of, out of football for about a year. I mean, he's going to Eden Prairie High School, had a bag of balls going to throw, and then, and then he went to Washington Redskins and went to Kansas City. And then he then he flourished, especially in Kansas City, and and then and then Oakland took off. It was an MVP uh, MVP player, won the MVP actually, and so went through three four systems. And it's different nowadays because because of free agency. Of you know, Peyton Manning he didn't retire in Indianapolis, and Tom Brady didn't retire in in, in, in New England. Those those kind of days are almost over now. So uh, you're going to bounce a little bit, but you know, for Rich and I. It, you know, and for me, for my moment, to be honest with you, you know, everybody talks about the John Elway moment, you know, when he ran into the end zone and dove and cut a helicopter deal. But, you know, one of my moments all my life, everybody said I was too slow and, and all those kind of things. And it's interesting. And then, 
And I remember John, when I met with John Gruden, the very first meeting I had, he said, Brad, can you make, I know you can throw the ball and all those kind of things. Can you make plays with your feet? And I'm sitting there lying to him, you know, nodding my head. <laughs> and uh, I think I had 34 sure, yards yeah, I can do that. the whole season. <laughs> and, uh, but the night before the game, he said, Brad, I need you to make a play with your feet. And there's a third and nine play. It was bunch right, 72 crisscross wide swing. No one's open. And I scrambled for nine yards to get the first. And no one ever remembers that play, but it led to an 89-yard drive. So that was my moment. They just they just didn't talk about it publicly except me telling you now. But, um, <laughs> but there, it's, you know, Rich Gannon, he was an incredible quarterback, had, a, had an awesome career. I looked up him too. Was he one of those guys, Brad? And I've, I've had <laughs> guys and quarterbacks that I've, I've – played with and just been around that have impacted my career you you being one of them who who was rich one of those guys that really taught you a lot about the game and how to be a pro in itself I mean you talked about being in college and I know how it was for me being a division three player coming into the NFL and me my, my head was ready to explode and you know the complexities of the offense and the speed of the game and what you know I had guys that could you know I could lean on and and, and ask questions and just you know things that I thought were you know wasn't a big deal that that was to to them and I, I just learned a lot from who who were those guys obviously rich was one of them but the, was there anybody else that really impacted your career as far as uh playing the position of quarterback no doubt about it. when i came in as a as a rookie i mean like just learning the playbook it was just it was just overwhelming to me just i think we had 10 or 11 different protections and you know go, go to line of scrimmage axe double right spear leg 735 h pump double cadence on two check with me i'm like check what you know what i mean like <laughs> <laughs> you know, check the box, what the box, I mean, I don't know, you know, so those are kind of things I had to grow up. So it wasn't really rich. I, I think what I learned from rich was just how tough he was and how to deal with adversity and just how hard he worked. And then the next year being with Jim McMahon, just different ways to lead. There's a lot of different ways to lead, a lot of different ways to win. And it's not always about the numbers. It's about getting those guys to play for you and come through the clutch, but I learned a lot from him as far as just how he led his team. But then, Got at that about my third or fourth year, I knew the system. I, I, you know, I think the guy that really grew on me a lot was Warren Moon and how he led the team and how he dealt with the press, how he uh, dealt with throwing a touchdown, how he dealt with an interception, how he dealt with people booing him, how he dealt with people cheering him. That's a, a lot more, more than, than just throwing a football and playing the quarterback position that people don't ever really, really get. And I think Warren Moon probably grew the most on me as far as, you know, the way it impacted my career. I couldn't believe the way he rattled off that play call after just listening to Jim, he had pulled up something on Gruden and, and, and some so of those, wordy. some of those tags uh, of the different formations and your protections. And I mean, to think all that stuff that you have to be able to pile in into your brain to be able to process while the bullets are flying out there. And I got to think at least one time, two weeks leading up to the, to the Super Bowl, you probably thought, okay, I got to deal with Charles Woodson, Rod Woodson, Bill Romanowski, and trying to fit all this other stuff in there, you know, trying to play your game and play your offense's game. But it's kind of a daunting task as well, isn't it? It is. It is. I mean, you're talking about the players you had to deal with. I was having to deal with learning the plays every week. And you might throw four or five touchdowns in one week, and then on Wednesday, just try to call and play in the huddle. It might be you shift to green, left, west, F, short, spire, two, wide, and as the over. Heads up a 359 smoke, or it might be green light slot, 97W. Heads up for a buster call, check 96 Seattle, or check 58 Dolphin. I mean, like, how are you going to call it? You know what I mean? It, it's, so, it, it's like you said, it's so daunting. And yeah. for the people that are out there that don't know much about John Gruden and his system, he's telling almost every player, it seems like, what to do on every single play. So the verbiage and the, the length of the play, and like you said, when I went down to Miami, uh, for, forget about how fast the game was, you know, playing against Otterbein as opposed to, you know, the, the, the Washington Redskins or something. Forget about all that. Forget about the, the, the speed of the game and everything else. I was just trying to call the play in the huddle correctly before I even broke the huddle, before I even looked at a defense. And, and then it was like, oh, my God, these, you know, who's, who's the I, uh, point out the mic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's Mike. Yeah, Mike's over there. That's Mike Scott over there. I mean, we, we didn't point out anything at Mount, except maybe there's a guy that might blitz off the edge, but the yeah. system and the amount of verbiage that you have to be able to spit out and communicate and just make sure that everybody hears the play correctly before you even break the huddle, before you even take the snap is unbelievable. And to play in a system like that. Yeah. And it, I always had a hard time when the system was so verbal. I just, I struggled with it. I mean, I knew what the play was, but it was just me communicating it. 
there, there's no doubt about it. When, when Rich, when Rich Gannon, when when John Gruden got traded to to Tampa, the first phone call I made was Rich Gannon, and he said, "Brad, it's going to be a lot of work, but he'll program you like you've never been programmed before. You'll be game ready on game day." And and I thought, man, I got a lot to learn. I, and and I spent more time uh, on the play sheet than I ever did watching film uh, because I just want to be able to call the play in the huddle, and be able to call the the, the play in the huddle the right way, and but then being audible ready. And Gruden was, you were definitely programmed. The great thing about him, Jim, was like, it wasn't, you were with him all day long from 7.30 in the morning to 5 when you left. It wasn't like he just gave the game sheet and left and then watched a little bit of film afterwards. You were with him, you agreed or disagreed on every play, but he definitely had your program. Well, I'll tell you what, you think about um, some other stuff in your NFL career outside of the Super Bowl and outside of Tampa. What's that feeling like when an organization – I uh, don't know if you go by Washington Redskins or the Washington football team anymore. It's hard not to say Redskins. I mean, just yeah. the way I grew up watching the game. But when a team goes all in like they did for you, you know, dropping first, second, third round draft picks, I mean, what kind of feeling, what kind of confidence does that put inside of your your mind? Yeah, I've been seven years in Minnesota. I've been through a couple of injuries, and I was looking for an opportunity to, to play somewhere else at that time. Um, I thought I thought I was going to go to Baltimore, and they made you know obviously they, there was draft picks that were given up, but then Washington came in with more. And the greatness of that, they kind of got them all back when they made the Champ Bailey trade with uh, Ricky Williams. Okay. Got even more back, so it kind of did. But you know, I I, I love playing for North Turner. Uh, the first year we were there, we won the uh, won the division. It was a fun year, threw four thousand yards and. Just a fun year, to be honest with you. But I never thought about what they gave up for me. I was more thankful for opportunity, and then it all kind of worked out, you know, the, especially that first year. Yeah, talk about uh, who uh, Check Down Charlie is. I, I heard about this name that you used to get, and uh, I just didn't know if that was the type of quarterback that would be the first one in NFL history to complete 60% of his passes over 13 years. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they used to ride you a little bit. No doubt about it. When you look at last year's stats, you just look at last year's stats of all the NFL quarterbacks, there's only one starter that didn't throw over 60%. We'll leave the name out, okay? So, and now you got, I think there's four guys that are over 70%. So the systems have gotten better. Play callers have gotten better. Quarterbacks have gotten better and all those kind of things. And at the time when I played, if you threw over 60%, that was a, it was kind of a big deal, you know? And I was in that, but you know, I always said, first guy gets open is going to get the ball. And the running back's usually the best runner on the field. If he got open on check down, I was going to find that check down real quick. Sometimes maybe too quick. But, <laughs> you know, that, that whole saying that you never go broke taking a profit, I was going to take profit every time. Uh, hey, when you're looking at protection like that in front of you, um, maybe give us a couple good stories. Uh, I know I was lucky when, when uh, my quarterback won the Heisman Trophy uh, in 2006. You know, he did some nice things for us, got us, you know, some chain and, uh, a little medallion on it. And I know when, uh, you know, when my dad was playing for Joe after they won the Super Bowl, he got him a little money clip with a little diamond and a ruby on it. And just didn't yeah. know, uh, is there any, talk about any relationship special ones that you may have still with some offensive linemen to protect you for you. And maybe some things that you did for those guys just to say, thank you. Yeah. I think the first kind of thing you ever saw was, um, uh, that's a way back when it was Dan Marino. I think he gave him the isotoner gloves, but he lived in Miami. So I don't know if they ever used those ice cream gloves. <laughs> Just when they went to yeah. Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. But I always, you know, any, I, I would take the guy, I would take the lineman out. Uh, I wouldn't do it every week, but I would take him out uh, periodically to you know, a nice dinner place, those kind of things. And then at the end of the year, I'd always give gifts. It was anywhere from, at that time, uh, I'd travel, travel packets on planes or TVs or whatever they were, any kind of gifts I could give them. I, I always made sure I did that. I gave them to the whole offense. And then I would give them, I would even give them to the PR guys and those kind of things. I, I felt anybody that was on my side and kind of helped me out, I'd give them a great Christmas gift. And those are, those are kind of things that kind of go a long way sometimes. It's that relationship on the 1372 show, man, the QB and the OG. It's, it's a special bond. Gotta take we care have, of your man. lineman, man. Always got to take care of your lineman. Hey, we appreciate you joining us, Brad Johnson on the 1372 show. Uh, before we get out of here, man, Got to put a little bit of shine on your son, your sons, both of them. Uh, obviously, Max, um, he started to get out there into the limelight as one of the more premier quarterbacks in, in all of college football. And obviously, your son, Jake, as well. Put some shine on your boys real quick. Yeah, it, it's crazy as a parent. Now I'm sitting in the stands. I'm just a dad eating popcorn. So 
I had no control. I've coached him pretty much out of the womb, both of them. Max is kind of living his own, you know, blazing his own trail, playing at quarterback at LSU. And uh, it's fun for him just to play. Um, and it's fun for dad to travel all these miles and mom and dad to go see him play. So he's a lefty, number 14. So I'm sure people get to watch him over time. And my other son, Jake, uh, he's a tight end. He's going to LSU. He's committed to go there next year in January. So it's just fun being a dad to watch your kids grow up and then kind of live their own dream. Probably gets a little uh, secret inside advice from Uncle Mark, doesn't he? <laughs> Find it, throw it to the first guy open is what he says take care of that ball don't don't be afraid to check the ball down right. the, the, the great thing for us is i mean we, we look back to our experience in, in, in nfl europe in 95 and and one of the other guys that was there was doug nesmeyer who who played at idaho state with with the receiver that we won the world bowl with yil murphy who was the mvp of that game so now we fast forward to 2021 your son max is starting for lsu and Who's who's the backup now? Yeah, <laughs> Doug, Nesma, Nesmeyer. Doug, Doug Nesmeyer's son. So you're seeing second gen uh, NFL guys starting to come through, which which is pretty cool stuff. And uh, Max is playing extremely well. How, how did he become a left hander? The, the only thing that I thought was, you know, you're you're, you're probably like, well, I know physically I, I got pounded playing playing you know uh, in the NFL for as long as I, I as long as I did. I'm gonna tie his right arm behind his back because in major league, if you if you can sling it and you're left handed <laughs> pitcher. <laughs> you got a pretty good chance of getting drafted pretty high, but uh, that's great to see him spin it. The crazy thing about Jim, I thought he was right-handed too. He was two years old. I was trained to, <laughs> I had trained him throwing with the wrong arm. <laughs> Someone else had to tell me that. So that's a great story. But, but, you know, Jim, I don't know if everybody knows, but even on that 90, our 95 team, we had uh, talking about generations, but LeVar Ball was a backup tight end for us. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's right. You know, yes, so I do kind of, there that. were so many stinking kids that have gone off. We should do a, who's, a 30 for 30 on the, the amount of kids that have come off that team that have ended up playing, you know, college or pro football. But it's pretty cool. But LeVar Ball is on that team saying he's going to be famous one day. And he, he kind of made it. <laughs> <all around. laughs> he's famous. All right. <laughs> and we appreciate you joining us on the 1372 show, making us famous today, man. Brad Johnson, 15 year NFL. Man. At CH Vallis and Associates, we've been proudly serving the greater Stark County community for over 78 years. Locally owned, we cover your home, auto, business, and life insurance, along with your group benefits. Our partnership with auto owners has allowed us to span not only Ohio, but throughout the entire country. Did you know that auto owners, an A++ rated company by AM Best and a Fortune 500 company, has ranked CH Vallis and Associates a top 10 insurance agency in the state of Ohio? From your basic home and auto needs to insuring some of the largest companies in America, there's a reason people choose CH CH Vallis and Associates and auto owners. Our dedication and passion for our clients and their coverage is part of our commitment to excellence. For all your insurance coverage needs, there's only one call to make, and that's CH Vallis and Associates, located at 1302 South Main Street in North Canton. Contact us at 330 494 2776 today and see the difference in customer satisfaction. Just talk about the partnership with the NFL oh and, my and, God. And, and what you guys do with the Northeast Ohio Cleveland chapter and, and the special. Thanks, Olympics. TJ. Uh, the partnership is magnificent. Uh, Christine uh, reached out to us oh, probably eight, nine, almost a year ago. And, of course, uh, it's just yeah, ideal to work with Special Olympics Ohio. Uh, there's a lot of synergies there. We, our missions overlap as far as the, the sports aspect of it. Th they're all about sports and they're all about athletes and they're all about inclusion and to be honest with you that's what we're all about too and uh it's just a perfect partnership and we're so happy that uh you know it, she reached out to us and it looks like hopefully it's going to be a great day right christine yes it is all right. christine uh talk about what you've done with the special olympics ohio how long you've been there and, and talk about this partnership and how you, it impacts you guys sure so i've been with special olympics for a little over a year and a half I'm the chief development officer, so I oversee all fundraising initiatives for the entire state of Ohio. We serve the needs of over 20,000 athletes in and around the state. And for us to be able to be aligned with the NFL alumni here in the Northeast region of the state is huge. We want to make a deeper presence. We want to engage more athletes in this community, and this is allowing us to do just that. So, so proud to be associated with Frank and his, his group and uh, this is just one example of how we can come together to raise awareness first and foremost, but even more so um, raising funds to serve uh, the athletes that we do here at Special Olympics. When you talk about raising those funds, how can people around Ohio, how can people around the country find you guys and, and get involved? So it's very easy. We have the, such a, a, a 
basic um, website that allows you to go there and learn about ways to be involved, whether it's volunteerism, helping us uh, through fundraising initiatives. Uh, you can just go to www.soh.org. It's super easy and um, and honestly, we do programming in every one of the 88 counties, and there is so much need for us to find volunteers to help these athletes with their weekly practices and getting involved in the regional competitions. So if you go to our website, you should be able to learn all sorts of ways that you can plug in and be a part of events like this or some of the programming events that we do. Christine Hoyer joining us on the 1372 show, the QB and the OG. She's with the Special Olympics and a very special football player joining us here now, Frank Stams. Frank, uh, from Akron, St. Vincent, St. Mary to Notre Dame to the NFL and the teams that you played with, that platform has allowed you to work with a lot of different charities over your time. Talk about how the game has benefited you in those aspects because really, uh, and, and I'll take a, script, uh, a page from down there in Columbus, but paying it forward, giving back, because the game gave so much to us. Well, you ask me how it, how it has affected me or has given me an opportunity, this is a perfect example. I mean, the game has put me in front of Christine Hoyer in Special Olympics, and we'd be remiss not to mention our sponsors, our, our title sponsors, Bridgestone, Knights, Knights of Columbus, and Wells Fargo, for their contribution today because they're really supporting this effort big time. But, you know, it, you know, it just, it's just the NFL has, has meant – you know, as far as, you know, just pre my presence in the community, being able, I mean, you hang your uniform up, what, yep. 25 years ago, but you still use your uniform to do good in the in, in the community. And yesterday I was down at the uh, Hall, of uh, Fame. Hall of Fame. Phenomenal and, and day. And the athletes were playing uh, flag football in the stadium. And you talk about energy. If I had half their energy, <laughs> I'd be in the Hall of Fame. You yeah. saw the play. I mean, you saw the <laughs> smiles. And uh, it was just outstanding. And the coaching that was going on, all the support staff surrounding it, I mean, it was big time. D TJ, you would have just loved it. It was a great day and really applaud uh, Christine and all her, her group, Julie Seck, Libby Schaefer. Uh, and uh, Jackie Oney. Jackie yeah. Oney and, of course, uh, Jessica Stewart. Yeah, our CEO, CEO, yeah. Christine, uh, that, that was another example of things that you guys do within the Special Olympics down there at the Hall of Fame Village, having that inside of Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium. This event here with the NFL alumni chapter in Northeast Ohio and yeah. Cleveland. Talk about some other things that you guys are doing outside of this. Absolutely. Well, there's several things on the home front for Special Olympics Ohio. We do our state competitions, and the state headquarters oversees the execution of all of those state-level events. The biggest event is held in Central Ohio at The Ohio State University, yes. where we bring in 3,500 athletes from every point of the state, and they come in and compete against one another, just like you would in a typical um, state competition you know, with, uh, with the Ohio High School Athletic Association. So we love to grow that. We love to get um, a better experience for our athletes. And yesterday was just a brilliant example of how we can use these tremendous venues to offer the highest level experience for the athletes that we serve here in the state. So um, other, we, we are so excited about um, putting together a delegation of almost 100 athletes that are gonna represent the entire state of Ohio next year um, at the USA Games in Orlando, Florida. And today here on the golf course, we actually have two athletes that'll be part of that delegation. Oh, and so awesome. there is such a tremendous need for us to raise money so that we can send those athletes down there representing our state and coming back with as many medals and, um, and awards as they possibly deserve. So Yeah, beautiful day here at Silver Lake Country Club. Uh, golf getting ready to start here, Frank. Talk about some of the guys that have come, uh, that have gotten on board here, some of the players uh, giving back to this charity. Yeah, thank you for recognizing our team captains or the NFL alumni that will be with each foursome. Uh, players like Greg Pruitt, Reggie Langhorn, Kevin Mack from the Cleveland Browns, uh, Ben Davis. Andy Katzenmoyer. Andy from Katzenmoyer Columbus. from Columbus. <laughs> Calvin Murray from Columbus. Uh, Jim Carsadas is coming up from Columbus. And uh, our own 1372 show co-host, Jim yes. Ballard. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah right. And, and TJ, we got to get you out on the course I told him I put time. those D3 yeah. guys down here <laughs> at the bottom. He gets a little sad. He said, I still made the College Football Hall of right. Fame, though. <laughs> right, right. No, so it's just like we can't thank them enough for taking the time out of their day because they get asked throughout the year to do so many events. And for them to take a whole day, because yeah. it is a whole day. 
and uh, to, to, to take their time, and, and but it's they recognize, you know, uh, the cause and, and how important it is, and, and, and they reckon and they and they've got a, an a affinity towards the, the athletes at Special Olympics, so yeah, it's just wonderful. So I, I do appreciate all their their support today. I'll leave you guys with one little story here because I know we're getting ready to tee off, and you got some more announcements you got to make. Uh, again, great job, applause to both of you guys for getting this thing done. Uh, but you know the NFL has impacted my family so much, you know, my father and, and what he was able to do. And, and I spent just a, a brief time. I was there enough to get the polo shirt, the workout shorts, and the picture taken. A and polar then, plunge. You know, it's it's <laughs> one of those things. Sometimes it doesn't work out for all of us. You know how hard of a game it is, Frank, and you know the toll that it takes on our body. But getting a chance to play in the Big 33 game was one of the greatest experiences I ever had playing football because we were paired for that week with our, with our buddy over there in Hershey Park, and we spent that entire week going to the amusement park and different events, and it's something that I always hold near and dear to my heart, just like playing an East-West Shrine game when you get to go to Shriners Hospital, and, and just to put a smile on someone's face for, for, for that bit, even even to brighten their day, a bright, beautiful day that we have here today. Uh, kudos yeah, to both you guys. So, uh, you know, leave the world, like as you're referring to, leave yeah. the world a better place than yep. you know, when you began, and that's what it's all about. Frank Stams, Christine Hoyer joining me on the 1372 show, the QB and the OG. We'll be back here for more at Silver Lake Country Club.